Hello everyone and welcome to the second introduction video in our exploration of construction grammar. In this video we will look at two different ways of doing linguistics and how this changes how we define what a construction is. My name is Remy and I'm heading the language research unit at the Sony Computer Science Laboratories Paris. Today's video is called Beyond the Saussurian Sign. A quick recap of last video, we saw that Charles Fillmore introduced the idea that we can build an entire grammar based on grammatical constructions. We only vaguely defined constructions as any conventional coupling between some meaning and some form. The word conventional indicates that such a coupling may be different for different languages. Indeed, the idea of a construction goes back to one of the central concepts in linguistics, the Saussurian sign. Ferdinand de Saussure introduced the Saussurian sign as an arbitrary, or conventional, mapping between what he called an acoustic image and a concept. The example you see here is a representation of the word lion in phonemes and its relation to the concept of a lion. The word arbitrary means that there is no necessary relation between the two sides of the sign. Indeed, different languages have different words for the concept of a lion. Since the Saussure, several linguists have argued that the notion of the Saussurean sign is not only useful for words, but that, as Thomas Hoffman and Graham Trousdale wrote, perhaps all levels of grammatical description involve such conventionalized form meaning pairings. This extended notion of the Saussurean sign has become known as a construction. Construction grammarians therefore typically represent a construction in a symbolic diagram that contains, just like the Saussurean sign, a meaning part and a form part. Here you see an abstract diagram by Bill Croft, another leading scholar in the construction grammar community. This diagram notation is a way to represent any construction, whether you have a word or a grammatical construction, in a way that's easy to read, but which hides certain details. Later in this video series, I will introduce a formal notation that allows us to describe constructions in very precise ways. Let's look at an example of this. Here you see the lion construction, which is just like the diagram of the Saussure that we saw before, with the only difference that construction grammarians tend to prefer to write a form part on top and a meaning below. Here is another example, but this time of an idiom, it's raining cats and dogs, which is a fixed expression that means that it's raining heavily. Both the line construction and the it's raining cats and dogs construction are similar. There is one fixed form, which can be one or more words, and a conventional meaning that is attached to that form. Idioms, however, can be only partially fixed and leave some other parts open. A well-known example is the phrase to kick the bucket which is an informal expression that means to die or to become dead. The difference between this idiom and it's raining cats and dogs is that this construction consists of two slots. There is one slot that's already filled in with the words kick the bucket, but there is also an empty slot for the subject. Moreover, the specific form of the verb kick interacts with the tense aspect modality system of English, which is what TAM stands for. And this means that, depending on what you want to express, you can say that someone kicked the bucket, has kicked the bucket, would have kicked the bucket, and so on. Different constructions can then be combined with each other, which you can think of like building things with pieces of Lego toys. You can always build whatever you want, as long as the pieces fit together. We can, for example, fit the line construction into the open slot of the kick the bucket construction to build what we call a construct. The line kicked the bucket. A construct is a construction grammarian's way of saying the sentence that you wrote or pronounced or the expression that you signed if you're communicating using a sign language. The kick the bucket construction is what is sometimes called a partly schematic construction because parts of it are open slots and other parts are already filled in. Fully schematic constructions are abstract constructions that have only open slots. One example is the English subject predicate construction, which has an open slot for a subject of a clause and the predicate that says something about that subject. Note that we use the exact same representation for this abstract construction, so we don't need to make a sharp distinction between what is the lexicon and what are the rules. Everything is a construction. Let's look at another example. Heather sings. Here we have two lexical constructions. Heather sings. Just like Saussurean signs. 
We can now combine these two constructions with the subject predicate construction in exactly the same way as we combined the line construction with the kick the bucket construction. The result of combining these constructions gives us the sentence or the construct Heather sings. We don't have to worry just yet about what it means for constructions to fit together or how we can decide when constructions do not fit together. What is more important for us now is that what we want to do with the construction depends entirely of the kind of linguistics that we're interested in doing. The first kind of objective that you may have as a linguist is to use constructions for describing a language. This is very important because any science needs to get its empirical facts straight. Here we find Ferdinand de Saussure again because he introduced a very important distinction between synchronic linguistics and diachronic linguistics. Synchronic linguistics is like freezing a language in time and space, or taking a snapshot of a language. One of the Saussure's favorite examples was a chessboard. In this analogy, constructions are like pieces of chess. There is a fixed number of them, and the moves you can make are also fixed. Or if we take our Lego bricks example again, constructions in synchronic linguistics are like pieces of a kit with clear instructions that you need to follow to build what's on the picture of the kit. The kit comes with exactly the type and amount of constructions you need for completing your build. Diachronic linguistics is then concerned with how languages change over time. But most of these studies will also divide the history of a language into a series of discrete states or synchronic layers. Historical linguists then describe the changes between different stages. Now it's important to note that every linguist knows that languages change only gradually over time and not as a set of discrete changes. In practice, however, it's all often impossible to track all changes in a continuous time frame, so we have to make certain abstractions. The abstraction that is necessary for language description is what I call the aggregate perspective, and this is definitely the most common way to do linguistics. In the aggregate perspective, linguists try to describe a language as if there was only one language user. They collect data through corpus analysis or by asking people whether they think a particular sentence is acceptable or not, which are then called acceptability judgments of those language users. Linguists use these data to compile an idealized form of the community language in the sense that they abstract away from the difference between individual language users, even though we know fully well that every person has their own way of using a language and that there are many differences between different regions and dialects. The kinds of linguistics that's associated with the aggregate perspective are synchronic and diachronic linguistics. There is also a second way to study language, which has only recently become possible thanks to new methods from computer science and artificial intelligence and new experimental design in psychology and neuroscience. In this second way, our constructions are not bricks from a kit, but bricks that you can combine in many different ways depending on how you conceptualize the world, such as this child who is building a spaceship using ordinary Lego bricks. Moreover, the amount of bricks is open-ended and you might even design your own bricks if you need to. The population perspective focuses on how language users engage with each other in locally situated interactions. In this view, the community language is a complex adaptive system that emerges spontaneously as the side effect of the local behavior of individuals who need to establish mutual understanding during each interaction. So instead of considering a language as a discrete state that can be synchronically studied, the population perspective views grammar as a real-time social phenomenon, as the linguist Paul Hopper said. Language is also temporal, always in a process but never arriving and therefore emergent. What does it mean for a language to be emergent? Let's take a look at this beautiful little bird, a starling. You can learn a lot about this bird by observing it closely, but something truly magical happens when it is joined by hundreds of other starlings in what is called a murmuration of starlings. And you can see that happening here. Those of us who are lucky enough to have witnessed the murmuration will never forget its mesmerizing sight of hundreds or even thousands of starlings swarming together in a whirling festivity of ever-changing shapes. What is really special is that all of this happens without practiced flight routines or one bird taking central control. 
Each starling is somehow aligned with the movements of the flock and is capable of turning and changing direction in a heartbeat. Now something similar happens in language. Languages change over time and entire parts of a language can get restructured or even fundamentally change without a breakdown of communication. There is no need for a central committee to check if everyone is still on board or some language observatory to spread the latest trends in linguistic communication. And likewise, children learn to use their community language without requiring explicit instructions and we continue to learn novel ways of expressing ourselves throughout our entire lives. Both the aggregate and the population perspective are important, but they have an impact on how we should define a construction. In the aggregate perspective, we can simply say that they are extended Saussurian signs, as many construction grammarians will tell you. We can simplify our definition in the sense that the mapping between the meaning and the form can be considered to already be established. In the population perspective, however, we need to put constructions at work in situated communicative interactions. In other words, we must study how language users employ those constructions to achieve their communicative goals. One important historical concept for the population perspective is the semiotic triangle, as introduced by Ogden and Richards. Ogden and Richards pointed out that the dual nature of a Saussurian sign has one important disadvantage, namely the fact that the process of interpretation is included by the definition of the sign. What they mean is that the Saussure describes linguistic signs as if they have a correct meaning, just like the rules of chess are fixed. In actual interactions, however, language users play a wholly different game. Words mean different things to different people, because each person has their own past experiences and background. The key insight of this semiotic triangle, as Ogden and Richards wrote, is that words mean nothing by themselves. It is only when they are used by an actual language user that they stand for anything. So instead of a dual sign, they propose a triangle in which words may stand for things in the world, but not directly. This relation passes through our mental representations, or thoughts, of the actual reference. If we replace the term word with construction, we get a similar observation. A construction can only be meaningful if there is a language user that instantiates the construction into a situated context. Constructions can therefore best be considered as schemas, a concept that was developed in artificial intelligence and cognitive science. Schemas, and they are sometimes also called frames, are representations that store and update information that we have about our past experiences. We use these schemas to make sense of new situations. For example, the late and great Marvin Minsky, one of the pioneers in artificial intelligence, introduced a birthday party schema, or he called it the birthday party frame. And this provides us with certain expectations about what we may encounter when we throw a birthday party. Opening presents, blowing out candles, eating cake and so on. Likewise, construction schemas capture the stable elements of past linguistic experiences and they can be considered as instruments that help language users to reach their communicative goals more efficiently. Since the semiotic triangle is considered to be outdated by now, I will use a more sophisticated concept that was developed by Luke Steels, another pioneer in artificial intelligence and one of the greatest thinkers in construction grammar. Among other things, Stales is an expert on emergent communication, and if I haven't forgotten, you should see a link to one of his experiments appearing in the video about this time. Stales has proposed that the study of language needs to take the whole semiotic cycle into account. The semiotic cycle involves at least one producer, who is the person who speaks, writes or signs, and a comprehender, who is the person who listens, reads or perceives. Both of them go through several tasks. Sensory motor processing concerns perception and action in which linguistic interlocutors maintain a world model. The second task is conceptual processing. Conceptualization is the process in which the producer decides which communicative goal they want to achieve and which meanings need to be expressed to achieve that goal. For instance, the same fact can often be expressed in many different ways depending on which information I find important for communication. Interpretation is the mirror process in which the comprehender needs to make sense of a meaning in terms of their own world model. Now, constructions are important for the third task, which is linguistic processing. First, there's production, in which the producer needs to verbalize conceptualizations into constructs. 
And then we have linguistic creativity and learning, which are two sides of the same coin. So both interlocutors are able to uh, diagnose and repair problems in communication, learn from situated interactions and make creative use of their constructions. There was a lot of information in today's video and some things might not be entirely clear to you yet. Don't worry about that, because all of these things will become much more concrete as we progress in this video series. For today, your take-home message should be that constructions are useful for two kinds of linguistics. The first one was the aggregate perspective, in which we try to describe a language as if there is only one language user. And in this case, constructions are like set pieces of a chessboard or a pre-designed Lego kit with well-established functions. In the population perspective, Constructions are schemas that are dynamically shaped and reshaped every time two interlocutors or more interlocutors interact with each other in local, communicative interactions. In this perspective, constructions are dynamic entities and you are free to build whatever you can imagine or conceptualize as long as the different pieces fit together. In the next video, I will conclude this three-part introduction by listing a couple of criteria that we will use to decide whether a particular linguistic study counts as a construction grammar analysis or whether it adheres to a different kind of linguistics. After that, we can go into concrete examples of how construction grammar provides innovative alternatives to the traditional ways of studying languages. Thank you for watching and I hope to welcome you again for the next video.